Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm reception. Michigan Vision Therapy Study Group 2022. Warm applause for our next speakers, Doctors Alyssa, Alicia, and Dr. Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. It's so good to be with everybody, and I thought what I would start with is a blast from the past. How many of you have ever played the game, Name That Tune? You all know what this is, right? Remember how it works? There's a leader who gives a few bars or notes from a song, and you, the contestants, are trying to figure out what is the song in the fewest amount of bars or notes. Now, why did I tell that story? Because it reminds me of when I was an optometry student, and we were preparing for our ocular disease tests, whether it be boards or whether it be tests. I don't know if you guys ever did this, Steve, but there'd be a group of us that would get around a table, and somebody would be the leader, and the, the idea of the game was to name that ocular disease with just a few chief complaint symptoms and a few diagnostic findings. And the whole idea was the first one to guess that was the winner. And we did this as a way to kind of prepare for our tests. And if you think about it, most of us in optometry school, we've gone through this somewhat of an indoctrination that the whole thing about identifying and treating your patients is, first of all, to associate the chief complaint with their diagnosis, right? What's their chief complaint? What's their diagnosis? What we're going to begin with here is to say that a patient is not a diagnosis. Naturally, it's important. We need to know what their diagnosis, their visual findings, and listen to them. We have to associate what is some of their chief complaints with a related diagnosis. But our patients come to us as individuals with a whole host of issues that are related to a visual problem. And some of these things could be, they know how to read, but they just, gosh, they're afraid of it. It's like a tsunami. Reading is like a tsunami to them. Or it could be that they maybe can read fairly well, but they have poor spelling abilities. Who would have thought that if you hadn't asked the question? What about the child who can read, has the ability to have some basic word recognition, but they have very poor fluency? They lose their place. We see this all the time. How about the math issues? Maybe not to read, but they have poor math issues. And if you hadn't dug into this, how would you know? The kid with poor handwriting abilities. They hate it. They struggle with handwriting skills. Or what about our child with strabismus? Now, that's obvious. We got a diagnosis. Parents' chief complaint is their child's eye turns. But that child has low confidence. They have trouble with obstacle-loaded environments. They struggle around with their peers. How about our adult with a concussion? Now, granted, we have a clause. We know what that is. We have a diagnosis and certainly some major chief complaints, but how this is impacting them in their work, their emotional lives, can be very significant. And a lot of our patients, they come to us with, on the surface, no real visual difficulty from a diagnosis standpoint, pretty standard, but they're having a problem playing their game. They're having a problem playing their sport. And so there's much more to this than just meets the eye. Yeah, that was a pun intended. So let's take a couple examples. What if we look at two cases, two patients with a reading problem? Two girls, 10 years old, fourth grade. Both have a diagnosis of CI, AI, OMD. They have visual spatial and visual form perception problems. We've seen this many times before, right? Am I wrong? You've seen this, right? Both report diplopia, double, blur, headaches, lose their place, when reading, reversals and miscalling words, they have some efficiency issues there, and both have trouble reading and score equally. Again, this is hypothetical, but they both score equally below on a standardized oral reading test. So, you got the diagnosis, you got their basic list of complaints, you implement treatment, and you expect the outcomes are gonna be great, they're gonna both be successful readers, right? Am I right? You implement the treatment, Patient one, relief of symptoms associated with her diagnosis. She has improved reading abilities and oral reading tests, and she loves to read. Now she's doing great. Patient two, relief of symptoms associated with her diagnosis. 
has improved reading abilities on the oral reading test. We see the performance on the test, but ah, I don't think so. She doesn't like reading so much. It's still one of her least favorite things to do. She'd rather be doing anything else but reading. Why? They both have the same diagnosis. They both have the same chief complaint. What's the difference here? Well, in our presentation today, I think we're going to be providing you with a key to help determine this and then target your treatment plan. We're going to be talking about in our presentation visual memory, visual imagery, and visualization, but more importantly, how it transfers to executive function. In our two presentations, I'm going to be basically going over the why, what it is that this is all about and the relevance to this theme. Dr. Liss is going to come in and talk about the testing, measuring, categorization, and ultimately the diagnosing of this. And then Dr. Leach is going to go over some case examples, some real live patients. We've got four examples. After the lunch hour, our team is going to come back and present treatment. So we're going to look at VT examples that are demonstrated applications that transfer to the patient's goals, but most importantly, transfer to accomplishment and confidence. Because nothing builds self-esteem and self-confidence like accomplishment. So before I get into it, I want to just survey you all and just get a sense from everybody here is what do you feel is the significance of visual memory, visual imagery, and visualization in your practices? Do you feel like this is an important part of your patient management? Do you look at this with, uh, yeah, I think this is pretty important, or is it like, oh, well, you know, what's the feeling? Does everybody feel like there's some importance? Can I see a show of hands? How many of you look at this and say, visual memory, visual imagery, visualization is a part of what we do? And what I see is pretty much everybody, right? Well, the question is then, What's the difference? How do you target the treatment and how do you transfer a patient's personal goals that involve attention, reading, development, poor directions, doing homework, the emotional side effects, and ultimately the inability to get things done? How do you transfer this to that patient? Because the definitions are somewhat cloudy in some respects. So we're gonna talk about first of all the definitions. And we've narrowed it, I've narrowed it down to three. There's, there can be other examples. Visual recall is not included. Visual manipulation I've not put in here. I just kept it to three. Visual memory, visual imagery, and visualization. Here's a quote. Visual memory involves the making of an impression by a past experience, the retention of this impression, and the recollection of this visual record into consciousness in the form of recognition or recall. That's visual memory. It's of the past. Visual imagery, we're calling this a mind's eye for creating pictorial imagery in the present for immediate and or future applications. Visual visualization is the ability to project that self-directed visual imagery into the future with action and purpose. So those are our definitions for these categories. But the next thing to ask is, well, how do you diagnose that? It's pretty important. When you say, we're talking about diagnosis, how do you diagnose these areas? You need a diagnosis because measuring and establish a baseline is a pretty important start of the patient. You want to know where they are in the beginning. Why? Because that helps you to communicate to your patients. It helps you to communicate it to your professionals. It also establishes the targets for your vision therapy to those specific diagnosed deficits, as well as determining if the treatment goals have been reached. So you have to have diagnostic data. And when we look at the examples of what we have to measure visual memory, those are pretty straightforward. Wouldn't you agree? Everybody uses the TVPS visual memory, visual sequential memory. It's pretty common. I see in some nodding. Anybody uses the motor-free visual perceptual test? Still using that? That's good. So we've got a couple examples. This is the Monroe 3. There's other examples, but you basically, with that test, you have a way of getting a measurement, a standardized score of visual memory. Visual imagery and visualization, now we've got a diagnostic problem because there's definition overlap. It's difficult to measure. There's no standardization, and the classification and categorization is kind of vague. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, just me talking about what those things are conjures up different thoughts in your minds as to what these things are. So therefore, we have a treatment problem. 
If we don't have an accurate visual imagery and visualization diagnosis, our treatment plan may not be very effective. And the success in treatment is more than just becoming good at visual imagery and visualization. So what Dr. Cook was talking about, it's not just about having the ability, it's how do you use it. It has to transfer to the patient. Their ability to use visual imagery, their ability to use visualization to facilitate accomplishment. And that's when we get into this category called executive function. How many of you, is this a term we're all familiar with? I mean, we don't usually read about it in the optometric literature. There's not too much of it written up as executive function, but if you get a neuropsych report, a psychologist report, it's pretty common, right? So what does that mean? What is executive function? Well, one of the things, I'm just going to list a few bullet points, is remembering instructions. Planning, organizing, strategizing. Focus, attention. Juggling multiple tasks successfully. Managing time and space. This emotional awareness of yourself and others also is a, an integral piece of that. Persistence. Persistence to accomplish your goals. And the ability to think flexibly and creatively. The ability to think. The ability to think. Have you ever thought about that? The ability to think? How many of you ever thought about the ability to think? That's actually called metacognition. The ability to think about what you're thinking. Cognition about cognition. And in case you weren't aware, there's actually a lot of literature published on this category. More of an interest, I'd say, in education psychology than we see in our arena. But I pulled one uh, that I found of a 2019 paper published in Frontiers of Psychology. It's a really interesting paper called The Role of Metacognitive Components in Creative Thinking. And in the abstract, it says metacognition refers to the knowledge and regulation of one's own cognitive processes, which have been regarded as a critical component of creative thinking. And I pulled this little infographic off of another site that is related to education, because a lot of times those in education, Steve, would you say this, this fits? A lot of in education are frustrated by their children, their, their students' performance, and they look at this process of thinking about thinking, and we have the example of where they have no clue, and then guilt, building the bridge up to where they have this awareness, this appropriate action, and the range of flexibility and strategies. And that all sounds great in an infographic, but how do you get there? What are you really talking about? So I want to go back to a definition. Now I'm going to dice, dive, dive into this a little bit more and, and slice it up. Metacognition, we're coining as the culmination of key cognitive abilities built upon visual memory, visual imagery, and visualization that ultimately lead to human performance, metacognition. Key cognitive abilities, we've actually came up with a, another way of looking at, we're gonna call them meta-abilities. Yeah, we made that up. So what we're looking at is 10 meta-abilities, and we're gonna be associating these abilities with the visual aspects that we're talking about in this presentation. So one, goal setting, meta ability. Number two, planning, strategizing, sequencing, organization, time management, task initiation and persistence, goal-focused attention, self-monitoring, multitasking, and working memory. So these are the subcomponents of executive function, where we want to bring our patients to. So let's break it down a little bit. What's the visual relationship? So we look at M1, begins with goals. You want to get something accomplished? You got to have a goal, right? You got to have an idea of what it is you're trying to do. True? And with that, it begins with a visual memory of the past. And it builds upon that imagery in the present. I see myself doing something because I did it before, and I'm going to visualize, put that visual imagery in place in the present. And then ultimately, Future, because this has to do with getting something accomplished. So there's the goal of doing it in the future, the visualization. So you got a goal. Well, now you got to have a plan. And with a plan, there has to be strategies that go with it. So you've got the visual memory of the past, using that to kind of construct some examples of strategies. But imagery to picture what it looks like right now, and then ultimately put it into the future with creativity. Okay, you got to do something with this, thinking future-wise. 
So you got a goal, you got a plan. Well, now we got to think about this has got to go in sequence. So you got to also use your visual memory to recall the facts and data and information, and then imagery to, again, properly organize the sequencing of information and visualization to create the step the following the stepwise directions in to make that sequence, right? We've got to have a sequence of events. Well, now you have to have an organization of it. You got the goals, you got the plan, you got this strategy, you got the sequence, but now how are you gonna put it all together? You gotta to organize this thing. So you got to draw upon your past experiences with your visual memory, your visual imagery to create the design and orchestration of it, and the visualization is really to picture that orchestration into the future. See where we're going with this? M4, M5. Well, this is gonna take some time. Okay, you can't just snap your fingers and voila, you got it. It's gonna take some time management. So you have to have visual memory and imagery for understanding the time that you spent in the past and how you can picture it in the present, but also projecting that into the future. Okay, so you got the goal, you got the plan, the strategy, the sequencing, the organization and the time management. Well, now you gotta get started on this thing, right? Got to start it. Visualize prioritization, sticking to it. Visualizing habituation. A lot of this is what Neil was talking about, right? Got to stick to it. Got to get it done. But you got to picture yourself doing this. So now we're looking at the next step, M7, which is focus on the goal, your attention. Keep your eye on the prize, okay? Visualize this in the future, the ability to attend selectively with visualization focused prioritization is remembering what you did, sustaining that into the future, but also the ability to divide that, okay? Divide that attention. So you got the plan and you've mapped this out. Now, how do you know whether you're getting there or not? So there has to be a way of monitoring this, self-assessment measuring results and using visualization to make modifications. Because it always doesn't go the way you thought it was gonna go, does it? Never. Multitasking, another key aspect. Now we're getting to higher levels. You've gotta be able to use visual imagery, visualization for flexibility to roll between the variety of goals and project tasks. But also stay focused on your primary goal. So that's, we're calling that M9, multitasking. And then finally, this is the, I would say the, the most challenging one, and we're gonna dive into how we can design the treatment to work on this one as well. But the visual memory for remembering good sequences that worked in the past to accomplish your goals, and also the imagery associated with, and the language, coming back to this language, I think that was really brilliant to bring that up and help us associate that language piece to it while new objectives and strategies are being developed. And then the visualization for understanding cause and effect and projecting these strategies in the future. So these are the elements of our meta abilities. So the goal is, the point is, we want to use these areas to develop visual memory, imagery, and visualization as a vehicle. Think of that as the, the vehicle to get where we're going and targeting the meta abilities is the key to the accomplishment. Okay, got a sense of where we're going? Okay, so we're gonna turn it over now to Dr. Alyssa, who's gonna talk about the testing and measuring categories and diagnosing. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. I love this slide, all the colors. <laughs> all right, so now, before I jump into all the testing, another quick semantics review, because to me personally, all three of these a lot of times get muddled in my brain. So I wanted to start just with that, giving a brief overview. So visual memory, we know it's the ability to remember or recall information such as activities, pictures, words that have been viewed in the past, past being the key part to this one. And then of course we have our short-term visual memory and our long-term vis visual memory. Poor visual memory can cause difficulty recognizing letters, numbers, reading, reading comprehension especially, spelling, copying from board to paper, being able to chunk longer sequences instead of going every single letter those kids that are taking a really long time to get their notes down, um, forming mental images of words, having that vivid picture that they're now referencing, the language component, 
So, you know, if they're trying to picture a lion, well, what are they actually picturing? Do they just see the word in their head or hear themselves kind of as a narrator as they're saying these words? Or do they have this very vivid depiction of what that lion looks like and the colors and all the information? Do they have a wild lion like this one is with lots of colors and vividness? Visual memory is probably the one area that we have the obviously most standardized testing that we can look at with them. Um, and row three is one which is on the right, which is sequences of pictures that they study on the cards and then they write and draw out those pictures. And then of course, TVPS are visual memory and sequential memory. Two things to really keep in mind that I always have our team look for with visual memory is just observation when they're doing the test. So as they're doing it, you know, for visual memory, are they just looking at the picture and, you know, actually truly visualizing it? Or are they saying, okay, that looks like a paper clip, that looks like an envelope, talking their way through it. And it's incredible to me because you see the little kids do that, but then you see the much, much older adults that their entire strategy to remember this is talking their way through it the entire time. When you get to sequential memory, you can either maths have made this trickier because that used to be my easy way as you could see them mouthing circle, triangle, square, circle, triangle, square. Sometimes you do hear them saying it over and over in their head. But then we'll also just at the end, if we're still unsure how they did it, just very open ended question of what was your strategy to remember those sequences and give them so they can give you information as to how they did it. When they're sub vocalizing to do it, we basically consider it it's an invalid test in that case because they're using completely an auditory strategy to do it. So we always make sure to mark that because our goal is to get them to the point where they're not having to say it over and over. Or the other big one that we see a lot is tactile strategies where you're literally seeing the kid try and draw it in the air or on the table as they're doing it. And it's not that those strategies are wrong because I always have parents in consultations that are like, well, I do it that way and I've made it this far. It's not wrong, it just is way less efficient. They're not visualizing. And obviously these patients are coming to us with a struggle. So we know that we have to work on that strategy. So eventually long-term goal with this one is that they're picturing it in their head. And so what we'll do is we'll load their auditory system. So now can they look at the pictures? Go ahead. We, no, I honestly don't. We more just observe the whole thing. And then when we get to retesting and we're working through it more, we'll say, okay, now count while you're doing it. Now say the alphabet while you're doing it. Because as soon as I know their sub vocalizing is their main strategy, then I already know in my brain that this isn't the way, you know, the most efficient way that I want them to do it. So but you could definitely. So that's what we're looking for with those tests. Then we jump to visual imagery. So visual imagery is seeing with the mind's eye, the ability to create the picture in your head for what's happening in the present. Um, it's an important precursor to our ability to plan effectively and engage in guided decision making. Now, remember with visual imagery and our team in the next hour is gonna go into this, it's not just visual. There's touch, there's motor, there's smell, there's sound, there's lots to it, and of course, emotion too. So we wanna tap into all of those strategies too in the therapy room, and one of our team members, Dr. Lester, is gonna go over some of that in the next session. Visual memory evaluation though. So this was something that our team, you know, really came up with. Honestly, it's not a standardized test by any means, but we wanted to figure out, okay, so say you have that child that did visual memory testing, the TVPS was fantastic, they didn't sub-vocalize, but they, you still know they're not visualizing. You know, parents will say, well, they scored high on this, but I know they're not doing that. Well, then what do we do? How do we tell, you know, what's the real underlying issue that we need to work on? So the WOW team created this, I think it was 2010, which was before I was even there. So while I was still in optometry school, they came up with this awesome testing sequence. Um, so this is what we consider our visual imagery protocol. And we test this on pretty much all patients um, at the beginning of therapy. And it's just a way for us to know where are they at in true visual imagery skills. So I have our little binder up here if anyone wants to actually see it. But this is what the testing protocol looks like. And I'll zoom in here. So the very beginning, they are shown a picture and it's a really vivid picture, lots of colors, lots of information, and we have them study it for 30 seconds. And then we say, okay, you're gonna study this picture and then we'll talk about it later on and ask you some questions about it. So that's the first part to it. Then there's specific questions that we're going through with our patients. So like first one is, do you ever remember the detail of your dreams? I'll never forget there was an adult lady that was like, absolutely not, I've never had a dream in my entire life. 
And it was the coolest thing. She like ran into the therapy room once she developed this skill and was kind of pissed at the beginning because she was like, it was terrifying. I had this really vivid dream and it was a really cool experience for her. But starting basic of just do they even have dreams and how much can they tell you about the dreams? So that's where the scoring comes in. One, two, and three is basically their vividness score. So if they can give you just a little bit of information or if they have no dreams at all, it would be a one. Two is giving you more detail. So it's subjective there. And three is they've got a ton of detail they're able to explain to you. Then the next one's just, can you describe a lemon? So what do they remember about lemons? What do they tell you? Do they tell you it's sour and the colors and the shape? And we don't prompt anything. So it's just whatever they explain to us. Um, can you draw a picture of your bedroom? So we have a little sheet of paper and they draw out as much information about their bedroom as they can. Then we go into some more specifics. So this is where we say, we're gonna give you a few letters at a time. Um, I'd like you to then remember the letters. So it's M-U-R-H. This one we do note if they sub vocalize to do it. Um, so that's one piece. And then they have to say it backwards as well. Um, I'd like you count to 10 as I show you three pictures and the pictures are in our little book here. And then they have to remember the pictures in the same order. Um, this next one, so skipped around there a little bit, but it's a grid that we use. And I know there's a vision therapy activity with a grid with different numbers on it. it has three numbers in different places on the grid that they have to study. And then we say, okay, we take it away. Can they place those numbers in the same boxes? And can they add one to each of those? So it's retaining the information, then adding to it, and then knowing the location. Um, what else? I'd like you to draw a smiley face with two eyes and a mouth in your mind, and then flip it, and then they have to draw it themselves. Um, next one, draw. you're going to listen to the description and then draw the picture. And then we give them this description of houses on a hill. And then last one, I'd like you to describe the picture that they saw at the very beginning and how much detail can they do. So all this scoring gives us just an idea of where they're at in their visual imagery skills. So we use this test a lot at the beginning of therapy, then we retest it later on to see how that has changed. And then visualization. So this is now the ability to project visual imagery into the future with action and purpose. This one's commonly paired a ton with meditation and mindfulness. Um, it's a very big one in both of those areas. And we came to the same conclusion, this one is more recent, that we really don't have a good way to actually test this so that we can measure any progress that our patients are showing in this area. So that's where we created another little protocol. Um, so this one, the therapist explains a situation. I want you to close your eyes and picture yourself winning an award. And that's the situation. And then we ask, five questions. So tell me about the award you're winning, explain where you're at, what do you look like, who's presenting it, and how do you feel about it? And again, at the beginning, we don't give many prompts. We say, tell us as much information as you can on these different areas. And you're going to have some kids that just say, you know, very basic short one answers, or I don't know, you know, those typical answers. And then we score it with how many details they give us. You know, is it less than three? Is it three to five? Is it more than five? And again, this is really just to give us an idea of specifically for visualization, where is this patient at in their understanding? The last one I think is so important, the how do you feel about winning the award? The emotional tie for visualization is huge. I like what you were saying, Neil, with the anxiety and all the patients we see coming in with different mental health issues. I'd argue right now, I feel like 100% of the kids I'm seeing have high anxiety and are on medication and therapy and everything. So this is huge for those kids. If they can get beyond where they're currently feeling to be able to visualize a positive event in their life and you know, truly what is that going to feel like, I think it gives them a ton of motivation and confidence. And that's what we're all about, you know, building that confidence for kids so that they can take an idea and really work towards it and know what it's going to feel like in the end. So again, this is one that we're starting to use more and more now to really isolate this skill from the visual imagery ability. And then here's kind of what our scoring is right now. Here's just some great tips I pulled for helping for visualization techniques, you know, setting specific goals, writing it out so they have a game plan in mind, adding the emotional tie to it, getting inspired by something, setting specific days or times of the day that they're going to think about what they're working towards so that it's a regular thing in their routine to practice. 
just like all the other things we talk about with reading or sports, you've got to practice that skill. It doesn't just appear overnight, unfortunately. Um, so that's a huge piece. And if you can help them to create those goal settings to get there, it's you know a huge piece. And then why do we care about enhancing visualization? So it helps your ability to set and achieve goals. It improves your performance, whether it's work or school or sports, helps to decrease anxiety and those things that trigger, you know, very nervousness, public speaking or riding your bike or fear of heights, you know, being able to visualize yourself doing the action is going to help to when you're in that actual situation because now you've prepared for it. Um, also helps with stress management and then that feeling of accomplishment. So that's why we care. <laughs> and then Dr. Alicia is going to give us some cases. All right. So I'm going to go over a few cases, examples of patients that I have had over the past couple of years um, that I found visual memory, visual imagery, and visualization played a huge role in what we were working on. So the first example is that child with the dyslexia or reading concerns that we've all had. We've all seen these patients. So we have Olivia here. She is seven years old when she comes to us. And she's got your classic diagnosis, C-I-A-I-O-M-D. But that's not what we care about. We know we can deal with that. It's the, the questions and the concerns that the parents have. She avoids reading. She has a huge emotional component tied in with that reading. Meltdowns, 30-minute meltdowns for reading one page in her book. Um, she just avoids it. She finds her way around it because it's not fun. Um, interesting to note when I was looking back over her case to go over this stuff, her family noted that she had difficulty with retaining, which I thought was a brilliant insight to come from the family to know and see already that that visual memory component wasn't there for her. Of course, the ADHD concerns were there when you can't focus on the reading. Those are the concerns that get raised. And she was always described as a busy person, constantly moving, doing whatever she could to avoid sitting and reading, looking at a page. So important to note here, she is in first grade. Here's some of the information that we have. I'm not going to read through everything here, but on the initial assessment, you can see she's really low in a lot of those areas. Her dyslexia determination test showed that she was essentially a non-reader, very phonetic in her decoding. I think she only identically identified four words on the pre-primer level. Um, interesting to note, though, her Jordan and her spatial relations were close to that age level. If you remember, she's seven, so we're close to that age level. But when you look at the visual memory, way below. And the sequential memory, like Dr. Alyssa was talking about, she was the sub-vocalizer and wasn't shy about it, too, very verbal in her sub-vocalization. So we had to work a lot on the visual memory component first. So we spent a ton of time working on her visual memory, kind of getting her to develop that ability to see things and remember it. So if you look over to the right side of the slide, now you're seeing those visual memory numbers start to climb up. Her sequential memory, she's still sub-vocalizing a little bit, but definitely showing improvement. Um, so then our next step is focusing on that visual imagery component. Can she see now? She's got the past. What is she doing with her present time? Um, and that was a huge struggle. She, again, wanted to avoid it because language was not something that she enjoyed. Um, so we worked through a lot of that, and now we're at the point where we're setting our stage for learning. Um, if we go back to the meta abilities that Dr. Dan talked about, she couldn't even get to level M1. She didn't have a goal. She had no desire, nothing in her to read. Um, and so we were working together to find a goal that could spark her intrinsic motivation so that she could begin to build those steps up to the visualization aspect and find some joy in her reading. Second patient here is our child with a vision and learning concerns. Um, so in this one, we have Jake. He's an eight-and-a-half-year-old boy. Again, looking at the top there, you see that classic CIAIOMD diagnosis. But again, not what we're concerned about. He's a hyperactive kid all over the place. Mom comes in with motor overflow concerns. He's got a fidget toy in his pocket. In the middle of the exam, he pulls out three things from his pocket. He's just all over the place. He's got things everywhere. He's our second grader. He says, I don't like to read. I hate it. It's my least favorite thing, but I'm good at it. And we see that on his um, 
Gates McKillrop oral reading test, he's at a 4.7 grade level. He's been working with reading tutors, but he's still just frustrated and angry with reading. He can read, he just doesn't want to. He's my I don't know kid. Walk in to therapy, what'd you do today? I don't know. What'd you eat for lunch today? I don't know. Who'd you sit by? I don't know. Who brought you today? I don't know. He had no idea, no idea. No imagination in him, no imaginary play. He had no sense of that present time or even the past, really. So how was he going to be able to project that into the future to find it? Um, and so, again, we started with our basics. The visual memory for him wasn't low when we tested it. His sequential memory wasn't low when we tested it. His reading was just fine. Um, but as we go through, we see, well, he had his other strategies. He's our tactile kid. He was drawing things out. He's tapping rhythms. He's trying to figure out any way that he can do, get around what he needs to do. Um, so we worked a lot with that. We worked on the visual imagery. And by the end of the therapy, he was telling me what he did that day. He could remember what he had for lunch, what he had for breakfast. Then we started to enhance that now to, well, what about or what are you going to do tomorrow? What's your plan for recess tomorrow? Can you think ahead to those things? Um, and so we're trying to get him to see that reading ahead helps him plan ahead um, and getting that verbal feedback towards the imagery aspect. One of the things for him, if we go back to those meta abilities, was we worked really hard and we found a goal for him. His goal was competition. He wanted to beat scores. He wanted to beat his own scores, beat everybody's scores. So then we took it the next step, well, what's your plan? We started developing a plan. Well, if I get to do this activity for two minutes instead of one minute, do you think I can get the high score? So now he's starting to think ahead, get that plan, and we want to transfer that to reading so that now he wants to read to learn how to get the best scores, learn to read so that he can really start to um, carry out what he's doing to beat his own scores. Third patient here is our concussion or our TBI patient. We have Denise. She's a 38-year-old and has a history of two TBIs, um, one in 2018 and then another one almost a year to the date later in 2019. So a huge emotional component to when you have two TBIs um, and all of that going along with it. She gets a lot of fatigue, headaches. Again, here's where our, com our um, complaints come in. She has been avoiding reading because there's just so much stress associated with it. This is hard because she's a homeschooling mom, two young girls, and she's got to read. She's got to know what's going on, but she's just been absolutely avoiding it. Um, there's times where she loses her thoughts. She can't string a sentence together. She can't speak. All those things are really pulling into her. And then the motion sickness concerns every time she gets in a car. Her immediate memory thought is motion sickness. I want to avoid that. Um, she tells me herself that she has terrible memory. She writes lists for everything. She's that verbal memory. She was auditory in all of her strategies. Um, there are her results from the TBPS. Again, not super low, but way auditory. Tactile, auditory, everything. Um, and she was just full of defense mechanisms. I got to get this done. I got to get this done. If we think about our meta abilities, she had a goal, she had a plan, she had a strategy, she had her time management down, she was devoting this, but she couldn't figure it out. She was stuck somewhere. Um, and it was part of that defense mechanism for her. So we're working on doing activities for the experience so she can engage in it and use what she's learning to build upon it in the future. Um, we've been working with some visualization techniques with her, trying to visualize some positive aspects, getting her over that aspect of the emotional aspect of reading, getting her to visualize herself being a reader again. Um, her visual memory, we've been working on trying to stay away from that auditory strategy. It's tough. It's tough for her, um, but we're working on it. Um, trying to get her to visualize activities to get the task done. This is one where we're trying to get her to actually slow down and visualize what her day needs to look like before she just starts writing down her list and then gets frustrated because she doesn't want to read her list because it gives her symptoms. 
Um, and then also multitasking with those visual components, trying to get her to be engaged so that she doesn't lose what she's remembering when she adds distractors. The last patient I have here is our sports vision patient. No, that's fine. Okay. All right, so our sports vision patient, we have, according to this picture, you can see it, we have our pool player, um, Joe. He comes to us as a CI and a presbyope. Again, we don't care about the goals, or the diagnosis, I mean, but his goals. He's a billiards player, and he's having some trouble because he can't focus on the ball. Um, Part of that is the double vision, but as I'm working with him, I'm learning that there's more going on. And then to tie into everything that we've talked about, he goes, oh, by the way, I don't really like to read very much. Mm. So we've been working on um, both his pool game as well as what he's been working on um, as far as his diagnosis. And we're working on that central peripheral integration because he's been struggling with that because he can't keep his goal-focused attention on the ball that he's looking at. Um, and so he, again, he's got his goal. He wants to be a better pool player. He's got his plan. He practices all the time. He's got his strategies, got his time management, but he doesn't have that goal attention. He gets distracted by everything. He gets distracted by people walking around. Um, he also gets distracted by having a poor shot. So this past week, I actually had him visualize a perfect pool game for me. And I stopped him every two seconds and said, where did that come from? How did you do that? What happened here? And suddenly he's like, oh, I've never stopped to think about those things before to kind of visualize and plan ahead in my game shot by shot to know um, exactly how to get that positive aspect so that he can approach a shot with positivity. So he's been a really good example of the sports vision, how that visualization really plays into pulling out those positive aspects. And then I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Dan to finish us out. Thanks, Dr. Alicia and Dr. Alyssa. So I'll take the clicker back from you then too. Thanks. Okay, so basically, in summary, we're looking at visual memory, visual imagery, and visualization as having a developmental hierarchy. That's one of the things to keep in mind. You don't get the visualization, visualization ability ahead of having visual memory. There's a hierarchy to this. And it's critical to the patient's success. What we do in developmental vision rehabilitation should have a methodology based on testing, measuring, and classifying visual imagery visualization, and visual memory so that the treatment can target the patient's needs. That's one of the key things that we're talking about in part one. And so in part one of our presentation, we're going into just kind of giving you a, a foundation for what we're going to dive into in part two, which we get into actual techniques. So the point is, it's not about having good visual memory or visual imagery or visualization. What we're going to talk about is 